Hey, hey, it's Andy Yannis, and you're listening to another episode of Pod Slamma Jamma, now owned by Let's Rage Cougs. On this episode, we will talk about the Houston offense, what are they going to try to clean up as they try to wipe away the Kansas game. Um, obviously, take less- lessons from it, but leave it in the rearview mirror. We will continue our sponsored series on name, image, and likeness. This time, we'll be focusing on how Hoop and Holler has been able to work with athletes, particularly with those star pizza commercials that have become kind of popular among the UH uh, Twitter community. And lastly, we'll wrap up with what the defense's focus is, a common theme among all the team, their mindset heading into Rice. Do your job. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Pod Slam a Jam. After the penalty, look at the timing. Six steals in the first half. There's Blair with the steal. Picked up by Cam Jones. On the offensive glass, so tough. And that's third game. Two possessions. Sasser tries and he hits. They call the prize Slamma Jam. As always, joining me, Dayon Dunlap. How you doing, sir? Man, I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing good. I can't complain. And obviously, when we get right into it, um, the brutal loss the Houston Cougars suffered this past Saturday at the hands of Kansas. Uh, they fell 48 to 30 in a in a really struggle all across the board. When you look at the defense, you look at the offense. Um, the game, it'd be hard to believe that it actually started out pretty good for the Cougars. Not only that they jumped out to a 14-0 lead, but the defense had two straight three and outs. And then it, it completely 180 um and they they kansas jayhawks were able to do whatever they wanted on offense houston cougars struggled to score the ball and be able to move consistently on offense so uh before we get into any of the clips because we do have a lot especially when it comes to where the the mindset of the program is now that they're sitting at one and two they have one more non-conference game in rice before they start conference play against tulane on september 30th but were are there any takeaways now that you've had time to a, a couple of days since the game against kansas just overall how did you saw Houston play um, this past Saturday? Um, nothing really. Um, after hearing the press conferences, it was things to kind of reconfirm what I thought I saw. And so we'll get into some of that later. But no, nothing really that I want to add outside of um, what I said on Let's Rage Cool. So those you guys who tuned in, we had great viewership. We appreciate yeah. everyone who tuned in for sure. Yeah, that, I mean, before we get right into that, big ups to everyone that watched Let's Reach Cougs on the Houston Round Ball Review YouTube channel, our most viewed show ever. Uh, last time I checked it, it was over 1,200 views just on the YouTube channel alone. It's a couple hundred more when you factor in the Twitter and the, the actual podcast listens that people have gone in after. So thank you for everyone. If you're one of the people that listen, that tuned in, we appreciate it and continue because we're not going anywhere for the rest of the season. And we will continue to do postgame shows once the men's basketball season begins as well so we thank you for that good reminder to if you are watching this and you're not subscribed to our channel at pod slam jamma like you said uh, scrolling down in the ticker at p-a-w-d-s-l-a-m-a-j-a-m-a for those of you guys listening on spotify apple Podcasts, wherever else you may be listening to be sure to subscribe that we're up to 160 subscribers in about a week which is pretty incredible a week and a half actually which is a pretty good start obviously the magic number for us is a thousand but before we continue to drag on and kind of plug ourselves we'll get right into it because head coach dana Holverson, kind of the message the mood of a lot of both Holverson said it the defensive coordinator doug ducks and a couple of players mentioned it houston's looking to turn the page but there's a big emphasis against rice the bayou bucket that i know that there's a lot of uh, noise surrounding that trophy that Holverson has mentioned but there's a lot more pressure on houston to come out not only win but play well you know, our guys cared. They tried home game, first home game. We knew this non-conference schedule was going to be hard. It doesn't get any easier this week, uh, you know, which I get into rice here in a minute. But, you know, we got to turn the page and move on. You know, uh, we still got things ahead of us that, that we can accomplish and be proud of. Uh, you know, nobody's happy about one and two with two tough losses against two good teams. We've played three bowl teams. They're all three going to be bowl teams, you know, so – you know, get get used to it. It's what's gonna what it's gonna be like here. But you know, I'm just disappointed that I didn't handle things better last week to get our guys to where they didn't want to win so bad. They pressed and and didn't do things the way that I know how they can. 
do it every week. You know, I mean, if we, if we get to a point where we're playing so undisciplined individually that that's just naturally going to take care of itself. I don't think anybody is so is is individually so undisciplined where it just keeps happening over and over and over again. It hasn't been like that. It's been it's been different people in different situations. Uh, I'm responsible for that. Um, so that stuff that stuff it was all we talked about yesterday. We're at a pivotal point right now. You know, I met with our, our eight captains yesterday. Uh, you know, I, I it, 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 make no mistake about it. I mean, we're we're in a pivotal point towards what this team is. Conversation with in terms of what they'll good, take. good. You know, I, I told them the same thing. I said, don't worry about being a captain right now. You need to worry about being a football player because a lot of those guys were the problem, and. Uh, it starts with them. So the best way to lead is to do your job. And I included me in that, you know, there's eight people plus me, so, you know, I got to do my job better. Um, I got, look, I talk to those guys all the time, but, you know, I just, I, I don't bring them in very often. You know, sometimes they come to me, you know, sometimes I call them in. You know, I called them in and just talked with them for five, ten minutes, you know. Not, nothing unusual. No, no sign of panic, I can assure you that. Last no sign of panic there. Um, interesting that it, he did call in uh, his eight captains to be able to talk about the season we had. We were able to talk to a couple of players since then, and really kind of the message that, that some of the players that were able to, to be a part of the meeting have said that really it was much more about focusing and, and reiterating what first one, how they have to clean up a lot of the mistakes that they have early on in the season, particularly when it comes to penalties. And two, uh, you heard it right there from Hogerson's own words, do your job. That's kind of the the motto that a lot of the players, Hogerson himself has said uh, this past week, this past Monday, this past Tuesday. And it really reminds me of the Patriots when you hear do your job, but that's kind of the, the slogan that Houston's embrace against race. Yeah, and that's what they need to do. And it's a good team to kind of get back on track of going against. I, I, I expect Houston to come out and dominate against Rice, just like they did last year. Came off a low, and they were able to get on track. Everyone played well against Rice, and they went on a streak that they went on. But, I mean, Rice – is and the rivalry is what it is. Houston should should play well and they should play well at all facets of the game, especially situational football. That's something that they've struggled in to execute in. Um, in I should say. Yeah, and uh, when it comes to um, Rice in particular, especially uh, from the offensive side of things, something that really Houston has not been able to do in all three games early on in the season has been consistently put together uh, – consistently put together drives on a on a basis where again going back to the Kansas game they started off well they scored touchdowns on the first two possessions they get they will score this in the second quarter uh again they score two touchdowns in third and then only managed to put up a field goal in the fourth quarter and again against Texas Tech they get held to just a field goal in the first half against UTSA they could only score one touchdown in the first half so and the, the probably the most frustrating part is that they have shown flashes I mean when you go back and you in going back to week one against UTSA I think Houston pull, put together um 20 or 20 I can't remember exactly what the numbers but they yeah, and, and just the fourth quarter in the overtime periods alone, the Houston Cougars, after being held to seven points for m much of the game, um, exploded in the fourth quarter and early on in the overtime periods. And obviously, of course, in, in that game, they were able to come out on top with the victory. But even going back to uh, the Texas Tech game where they get held to field goal, they, they kind of – credit to Texas Tech because in that game, they really struggled much more uh, offensively across the board. Uh, really, a lot of the points that – that they did manage to score on offense were set up by the defense. And in the overtime period, they were able to score um, in the first overtime period a touchdown. Uh, but in that game, it was much more of the struggles. Against Kansas, again, same thing. Like we reiterated, they started off good, and they were hot and cold for the rest of the night. Um, and going back to, to what I was mentioning earlier on, they, they were held to seven points in the first three quarters against UTSA. They managed to score 30 points in just the fourth quarter and the, all the overtime periods against UTSA. So, again, a lot of the hot and cold, a lot of inconsistencies among the offense early on in the season. 
a lot of inconsistencies. And I was expecting the offense, and particularly the quarterback, Clayton Toon, to keep that high streak going that he built them against UTSA, then against – I was expecting that in two Texas Tech. Then when I didn't see it against Texas Tech, it was disappointing. And it also just continued, like you said – um, hot and cold against Kansas. And so the offense, the running game really, in my opinion, hasn't been the problem. They've been able to run a game better and better each game. First game, Clayton Toon led him in rushing with some design runs at the end. And Brandon Campbell played well um, in the second game. And Tajon Henry had his coming out party for the season. And the last game had over 100 yards receiving. And so the running back court plays good, but just their passing game. It's no downfield passing game. It hasn't been hardly any deep threats, and they haven't been able to sustain drives. And so it's definitely been hot and cold. And I think against Rice, they'll be able to get back on track. Yeah, and like you mentioned, even in that Texas Tech game, um, they were able to do a good job of, of shutting down Clayton Toon when it came to damage that he did with his legs uh, against Kansas. Toon was actually able to to get much more yardage on the ground game, and he ended up with he actually ended up leading all rushers with sixty three yards uh, on the ground alone. So he was able to get that back into into the game plan. But really, like you said, it, it's just been hot and cold all season long, and one of the key players that he was able to make a lot of plays for Houston on in going back to the 2021 season. Now tied in Christian Trahan, who he talked a little bit about not only the struggles from the offense overall, but the other thing that has really hurt Houston and not just offensively, but also really in all three phases of the game on defense with a couple of unsportsmen like unsportsmen like penalties, and even on special teams that they've wiped off to a uh, tanked out punt returns. Here's what Christian Trahan had to say about those struggles from Houston. When, when it comes down to it, it's just doing your 111. Like everybody on the field has a job to do it. In order for us to all be successful, every single person has to do their job. It's not like basketball where one person can make a play. Like one guy can make a play and another guy has a bad play and it messes up the whole thing. So we all just have to be in sync, just playing as a team and just not doing extra stuff and just focusing on, on your job and, and just doing that to the best of your ability. It's a it's a mixture of a lot of things. Just the way we practice, we haven't been practicing the best. We don't practice how we play, and that's I'm not taking speaking on my team. I'm speaking on myself too. We haven't been practicing how we want to play, and it's it's showing on Saturdays. We're not playing the best. We're letting our emotions get the best to get the best of us at times, and just making bad decisions that's hurting the team and making them in really really bad situations. So from that clip from Trahan, I think that the biggest thing that stands out to me is how he said that the Houston as a team has not been able to practice the way they want to play. And it's shown in the first three games of the season um, where along the lines with Trahan, Trahan mentioned down when you hear that, what, what are your initial takeaways? I think Allen Iverson practice. We talking practice. <laughs> no, I'm nah, I mean, I probably could see some truth to that, but um, like I said earlier, I think really think it's situational football that they struggled in. Of course, they may you have going to have people throughout the game, but that's little things that you can correct, like Coach Hokerson said in his clip. Things like that, if it's individually and it keeps happening, it's just going to take care of itself. And so it, it's just been. Um, I kind of spread out through different players or different moments, different misassignments, different things at different times and situations where you can't really have it and it costs you wins and lo or losses. And so um, I, I think um, maybe at practice you definitely could, could practice more. So I think there's some truth to that. And I think um, – I'm surprised Christian Trahan hasn't been part of the passing game, especially in the intermediate game, because it's somewhat been effective. But um, Clayton hasn't really spread the ball out to many of his receivers, far, especially downfield. It's all been short or screens or um, a couple downfield passes, but nothing consistency where they're able to stay in trials outside when they've not been able to run football. A lot of screen passes and stuff like that. Yeah, when it comes to Christian Trahan specifically, he's actually been dealing um, with what he described as uh, a physical. They didn't want to use the word injury, but he's been limited by something physical early on. Uh, I believe it originated going back to training camp, and he's had to be dealing with it early on in the season. It's uh, head coach Dana Horst has said it's limited his his ability to practice, and that's really kind of hampered his his ability to be active, not active, but be a part of Houston's game plan offensively. Which I found that interesting, and, and going forward. Trey and said that he 
he feels much better. And he, uh, both Hoverson and Trahan said that they could see him being more actively involved in the game plan. In the game plan, so that's going to be something to keep an eye on. And obviously, of course, like you mentioned, uh, even in that clip, Trahan again mentioned the, the "do your job" part, which again reiterates the point that that that's kind of been hammered <laughs> to the players. Uh, one other thing I did want to mention about that captains meeting that Hoverson mentioned in in the original clip that we played at the top of the show. One of the other things that uh, I can't remember, I believe it was, it, it might have been Gervarius Owens that said it, but one of the messages that Hoverson kind of um, told the, the captains in that meeting is to put last season behind them. And that he, something that we're going to, I believe in one of the clips, Gervarius Owens is going to allude to it, but heading into the season, obviously there was a lot of, uh, expectations put on this program just in oh, terms hi. of what they, yeah, exactly, of what they were able to do, accomplish a season ago. Obviously, we, we talked at the offseason talk was who Cincinnati lost, who's going to be the number one team in the American. And Houston kind of kind of got pigeonholed into that number one spot just because, of, again, what they were able to do, who they were bringing back. And something Doug Belk has mentioned not only this week, but throughout the course of the season and even early on in training camp is that this team had to find its own identity. And I feel like early on they still have struggled to do that. And it, it's shown with the inconsistencies, I would say you, Dan. I mean, I agree. Uh, <laughs> I don't think there's really much to add. Um, I think I agree with 100%. Um, yeah, for sure. And I think in that point, it's a lot of wait and see because if they can respond against Rice, it, it's like you mentioned, or like we mentioned, or like how Hoverson mentioned in the clip, it's a pivotal point because, one, it's Rice. It's a game that they expect not only to win, but I, the last time I checked, they were favored by 17 points and whatnot. Um yeah. What Christian Trahan said, the, the mentality of the team going forward is to eliminate all that outside noise. Their mindset now is going 1-0 and each week, which it's going to be crucial for where this program wants to go. And something Derek Parr said after the game, something Doug Belk uh, reiterated again during his availability on Tuesday is, you know, they still haven't started conference play. And their big goal of winning the American Athletic Conference Championship is still attainable. And now it's just about we're really going to, be able to see what the team's made of just in terms of they can actually shut down all that outside noise and do they rally around and and respond strong against rice or is it much more the same where they've been unable to put together consistent performances uh, but on that note uh, that's going to do it for our first segment coming up next will be the second of our sponsored segment series focusing on name image and likeness where we're doing a spotlight on hoops and on hoop and holler this time we're going to focus on what it was like to work with some of the athletes when it comes to the star pizza commercials don't go anywhere you're listening to pod slime and jamma on the other side of that segment we'll talk more specifically about the defense and what doug Belk and javarius owens had to say don't go anywhere Hey, hey, it's Andy Anas, and you're listening to episode two uh, with Star Pizza, Hoop and Holler, Mike Pittman, where he takes us through uh, the world of name, image, and likeness, especially at the University of Houston. It's the following segment, the following series, like I said, that is focused on name, image, and likeness is sponsored by Houston alum Juan Miranda. You can find him on Twitter at Texas Juan. And Mike, last time we were here, we talked about kind of the origins of Hoop and Holler and how that came to be, where the idea came from, the inspirations. Now we're going to focus more on the fun stuff. What was it like actually being able to work with a lot of the athletes? And we'll start from the top, like you mentioned um, in the first episode. If you haven't done so already, please be go back and check last week's segment um, where we talked about the origins. But you said that you reached out to Marcus Sasser and Tremon Mark, who obviously, of course, both play for the men's basketball team at the University of Houston. You were kind of uh, you know, maybe not necessarily expecting both of them to get back to you and agree. They did. And long story short, you had them both in the restaurant. What was that process like? Sure. So one thing that we we really uh, underestimated was the the amount of scheduled day that student athletes have, um, mm -hmm. whether in school or out of school. The day is completely booked from morning to night. And and I wasn't aware of all that at first. So when we started trying to set up phone calls or meetings or get together and talk about different stuff, what we could do, what we couldn't do. Um, working with compliance, I realized uh, it took me a couple of weeks to get uh, after those guys had said, sure, we'll, we'd love to work with you. Uh, it took me a couple of weeks to get them actually scheduled. And we kind of picked 
we realized we were going to have to pick three or four different times and just if they showed up that was our time so uh that flexibility was really important to be able to work with them and i i learned we all learned that uh through everybody we work with uh, uh, even up to now. So having those guys finally figure out that, okay, we're going to do this on a Monday evening. It's going to be at five 30. Uh, how do we get them here? Do, do you have, do you even have, you're a student athlete? Do you even have a car? I don't know. I mean, I didn't think to ask those questions, but then I realized that nobody wants to say, I don't have a car, you know, or I need, I need, I want you to pick me up or send a car. So we, we have somebody that we'd used for a car service before that I really trusted. So I just sent him to pick up Marcus and Tremont and, and I sort of had a loose idea of what I was wanting to get out of uh, doing a little commercial with them. I didn't want to ask too much because I wouldn't want somebody to, at that point, I wasn't comfortable enough with myself acting or <laughs> asking them to act and, and read a script or anything like that. So we just, we just sort of goofed around and did basketball stuff and a couple of little pizza things. And, and uh, once we got around to, to them being a little more comfortable with us at, at first, it was the, the awkwardness of, oh, we have to do some legal paperwork and, and sign this and read all that. And then I'm kind of realizing as they're signing it, I'm like, Hey, I got an autograph. So that was, kind of <laughs> that was kind of neat. I didn't think about that part, but so then I had that and then we said, okay, well, what do we do now? Well, let's go in the kitchen and do some pizza kind of stuff. So we did that and, you know, try and put basketball together with pizza and get them to goof around with each other and putting it all together. I knew what I wanted in the end and I knew I pretty much had the, the steps that I wanted, the shots that I wanted uh, just for a short little thing to show that we were working together. And that was all, I could, that was all I could ask for, and it was all I had asked for. And it was for the first time of doing that, it was more than I could have expected. So we were really fortunate to get to do that. Those guys are the nicest guys in the world. Perfect gentlemen. Uh, I can't say moldable to do whatever you want them to do, but anything that we asked of them, they did. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, any, they, they probably would have done two hours more if we'd have asked for it. Um, we got to learn what kind of pizzas. I mean, it was important to me as a pizza guy to know what kind of pizza do people like? You know, a lot of people just like pepperoni. Some like, you know, some like honey mustard on everything. Um, and, and that was kind of funny. And we found a way to work that into some other stuff. So working with those guys was really neat. Um, learning how to get accustomed to their schedules was very important. And that was the, to me, the biggest learning step was that, NIL deal or not, whether there was money involved in something or not, my schedule didn't matter to them. They have a professional uh, school life and they have a workout schedule. They have a practice schedule. They have a weight room schedule. They have a tutoring schedule. And, you know, some of them have and, and they have a life. And I had to find a place to fit in there. And that was the hard part. But once we learned how to do that, uh, accepting that somebody didn't return my call or my text or, or inter internet message. Uh, it wasn't, I wasn't offended anymore. I realized that I'm just, I'm on the back burner over here. They'll get to me when they get to me mm -hmm. and being flexible with their schedules was very important. We, and that worked out great for working with DA Jones too. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting. I think that's not something a lot of people, you know, kind of think of just, yeah, like you mentioned how busy and how, it's got to be to be a student athlete and with their yeah. schedules, especially, you know, once whenever you guys reached out, it was the off season, but they still have, like you said, they still have to do workouts. They still have to have commitments and then just now amplify that whenever they are in their uh, regular seasons. I mean, it, it's got to be jam packed. So it's certainly an interesting uh, to hear you um, talk about that from your perspective. Um, you mentioned DA, DeAnthony Jones. Um, so kind of segueing over to the football side of things, one, when did, when did you know you wanted to do something before, with football? I'll team? tell you what, before we go to football, one of the hardest things I had to do, and this was a big challenge for me, was don't forget that I, I had to ask Ramon Walker to take a charge in my kitchen. Oh, really? I had to ask him because that was like a big deal to me was I wanted to, he, he had, gotten so much publicity for the way he was able to take a charge on the court 
Yeah. Like it was nothing. It was just natural for him to get into position and do that. When we were able to get him into the restaurant and talk for a little while, and I asked him, I said, hey, I'm going to ask you one thing. Without actually hitting you, can I ask one of my employees to kind of bump you and you take a charge and fall down and we'll make it look like it was harder than it was? And he said, no, that's okay. I'm not going to do that. And we shot (laughs) the rest of the stuff we wanted to shoot. And I said, I'm going to ask you one more time. Now that we've done all this, are you comfortable enough to maybe take a charge in the kitchen? And he said, okay, I'll do it. So <laughs> we went back and we shot that part. And that was a lot of, I was a, it was a big triumph for me because that was something that was integral to what I wanted to show was the, he was throwing pizzas in the air and, you know, making pizzas in the kitchen and, and having fun and, and picking up a pizza at the counter and all that high five in the staff. And, and then for him to take a charge from somebody and fall down was a big deal. You know, so I, it, and it worked out pretty funny. And he was a really, really good sport about it. Nicest guy, nicest kid in the world. Yeah, absolutely. You were able to, to win him over over the course of, of the shoot. So that, that, that's awesome. That was part that, of the learning cool. process was I realized yeah. I couldn't ask that first. I had to wait, let everybody get comfortable, and then I could ask for the moon. <laughs> for sure so now like uh, uh transitioning over to da and anthony jones uh, on the football side of things uh, was that a similar process just in terms of reaching out who did you reach out to first because uh you guys have the the sack av commercial uh, mm-hmm. which you yeah. It's funny that you mentioned Ramon Walker trying to draw charges because there are tackles involved in the Sac Avenue uh, commercial too. Uh, but what? How did you guys reach out to them? And 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 what were were those conversations similar to whenever you reached out to the players on a basketball team? Yeah, very different. A completely different approach. The the D A Jones thing was the first thing I had uh, football oriented was when we first signed this thing up and got Hoop and Holler Houston going, the first thing I really thought of was if I can't get any of the athletes to do something, I bet I could get Hawk to do something Mm -hmm. because our seats are in a spot where I see what he does after every kickoff. And, and it's, it's always funny to watch and, and he's a good sport about it. And coach seems really into it when he does stuff. So uh, I had reached out to him early on and he'd said, I'd love to work with you. And then after I talked to the compliance department, they said, well, you can do whatever you want with him. He's not an athlete. You can say U of H, you can say you can have the Cougar logo. And then we found out later, well, you can have the Cougar logo, but you have to ask nicely. So Mm. they gave us permission to use that. And that was a big step in learning how to to comply with NIL and comply with licensing and uh, intercollegiate licensing. Um, Those were all things we were learning on the fly. And we, we did ask for permission before we did anything. Um, so we would do it right. That was a big step for us was learning what was legal and what was not. But the DA Jones thing came after I had already done Hawk and all that. Uh, one day DA put out on uh, Twitter, I think just like a, a thing that just said, Hey, where are all the NIL deals at? And mm-hmm. I thought, well, there's no way the guy doesn't have an NIL deal with somebody. And so we just sort of sent the Google eye thing back and he immediately <laughs> did like sack Ave plus star pizza. And, and I thought, Oh my God, did we just reach out and kind of come to an agreement that that thing might work all live on, like on Twitter, on Twitter. <laughs> like I, and, and then I thought, well, now what am I going to do again? I'm in a position now where I've kind of set something up, teased something a little bit and I had no plan. So we started, we reached out to him and said, hey, would you consider just doing a, a single tweet or a post or something? And, and if it gets a lot of traction, if it works out for both of us, to me, that was important. And I had told all of the student athletes, if you ever got in a position where you didn't like the deal you were in, terminate it immediately, we'll end the entire deal. And we haven't run across that, you know, knock on wood, we haven't run across that yet. Um, but DA said, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be involved and, and I'll run it up the flagpole and we'll try and get things going and get as much traction as we can. So when we did that, we just did a single picture of him and said, you know, you'd be eating good on SAC Ave, whatever it said. And mm-hmm. that was just something I had put together real quick, came out the next day and it immediately had like 100 you know, retweets. I had told him, I said, I sure would like it to get to 100 retweets. Then then we can do something else. 
And of course it was there in like 24 hours. So that was a big deal to me. I, it showed that uh, football and the SACGAV brand was very important to, to the University of Houston fans and to the players. And we decided at that point that we needed to find something fun to do with him. And so I sort of just, I told my wife, you know, well, I could let him tackle. What can I do where I can let him tackle? Maybe he can call and order a pizza and I'll deliver it. And trying to figure out how to put all that together, how we could film it, uh, where we could film it. Um, we had to use an undisclosed location because it was, maybe it was okay to shoot there. Maybe it wasn't, but we got it all <laughs> done. And, and when I asked him, can, do you think you can get some other guys over there? He said, yeah, oh, sure. No problem. How many do you want? 10? Uh, no, no, no. I don't need 10 people. We just want you. <laughs> So, you know, he brought some of the guys over, Justin Beatles and uh, Alias Bell and, and uh, J. Mike was there, J. Michael was there. And getting to meet all those guys and hang out with them and talk and talk about what we wanted to do. I didn't even pitch the commercial to them until we got there. So oh, wow. it was really just don't wear U of H gear. Of course, everybody shows up in U of H gear every time. So <laughs> go through clothing change and all that. Um, but when I pitched it to them, they all laughed and I thought, OK, well, if they thought it was a funny idea, well, then maybe it'll work out. So I figured we'll shoot everything that we can. I had already done the restaurant stuff. So I was at that point, I was just filling in blanks. So I had everything was scripted at this. This now I've done this four or five times. I knew because I get stage fright. And I got nervous. And, you know, my wife and I are shooting the whole thing ourselves and and putting it all together ourselves. And, and it probably shows that it's very amateur, but it wasn't supposed to be anything fancy. It's just for fun and to, to prop up the school. And, and if we found a way to shoot a commercial for the restaurant, hey, that's a bonus. So mm -hmm. uh, putting it all together with DA was, was a lot of fun. Uh, awesome guys to work with. Those guys would do, if, if I asked them to jump off the roof, they probably would have done it. They probably <laughs> would have asked to land on me, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, a couple of things that, that kind of stood out from hearing you talk. One, um, it certainly seems like a lot of the ideas you, you have to brainstorm. And then once once you do you know, come up with them and you go to the to players, they're, a lot, uh, they're very open to some of the stuff that you throw out there, which is it's pretty awesome, honestly, just to obviously it, it kind of comes across in your commercials because they are really creative and even like you mentioned and they're all unique uh the sack avenue one is different from the one you guys shot with hawk and it's different from what you guys did with uh the men's basketball team so that that's kudos to you guys as well um one thing i did want to talk about which i found interesting was just in terms of the licensing component um with the university of houston is that what is that? What are those conversations like? Do you have to reach out to the athletics department, the, the university that goes above the athletics department? What, what is that? The University of Houston has an entire department, of course, just for collegiate branding, uh, for the U of H logo. The U of H, the main logo is the interlocking U and H. Mm -hmm. And anywhere that that appears, you have to have permission to use. And there's a time frame when you can use it. And we had always blown up the email of the compliance department over and over and over for all the stuff we've been doing. And, and to the extent that they probably, I mean, I don't know who reaches out to the compliance department, but once I found out there was one and it was free advice to me because this was all new to me. So reaching out to them was, was like having a mentor that could tell me that's okay. This is not okay. You can say this, you can't say that. Um, the whole SAC Av thing was uh, a monster in its own, uh, where I assumed I mean, the For the City is licensed by U of H. Uh, the hashtag for that is licensed by U of H. Of course, everybody uses it, and that's fine. You can't use it for commercial branding, which we learned. So mm -hmm. uh, the SAC Av thing, the first thing I asked was, is, is that something that the school owns? And they said, nope. And I said, are you sure? I mean, it's everywhere on all the school stuff. And they said, nope. And they left it at that. So when I asked again, there were some, they had already reached out to some attorneys. There were some, it was close to something else that they didn't want to get into a legal battle over. So they just let it go and used it. There was no, you can't use that. There was no, you can use that. But with the Hawks deal, the, the, I had already been told that since he wasn't an athlete, the NIL deals didn't really apply. Um, 
but when they all showed up in U of, some of them showed up in U of H gear, uh, we kind of paused and reached out to compliance and, and said, can we, do we need to change hats or shirts? Is that okay to use? And they said, well, it doesn't really matter, but that's a licensing thing through U of H. So then we had to go back to them. We went ahead and shot everything. And if we had to redo it, they had said, we'll come back and redo it. Wasn't that big a deal, but I had everything I wanted. We went through a period of working with the uh, uh, collegiate licensing at U of H. It's a whole different department. Um, Fortunately, everybody there was very familiar with Star Pizza, and <laughs> maybe that gave us an in a little bit to at least for them to say, well, okay, this time you're good. Next time, ask first. But we hadn't shown anything yet, and once we sent them the video, they said, it's harmless. The deal that you have is actually with Hawk. The person wearing U of H gear is not him, so he's an innocent you know, uh, bystander. Uh, he's just standing around really in the scene. He doesn't have anything to do with the person you actually have a deal with. So you could use whatever you want. So that was great. Great to know that if we did things that way with those guys, we were able to use the logo um, to show some school support because that's really what it was all about uh, in the first place. And the, the licensing thing with the school, those guys were extremely easy to communicate with and uh, very complimentary of some of the work that we did, as amateur as it may have looked, um, the, the the words from them were, were very kind and they were very nice to work with. No, man, for sure. Kudos um, just for the creativity standpoint with all the commercials. Um, but I like, I, I, I like corny. The first thing I tell everybody, <laughs> this is going to be corny. So if you don't like it, please tell me up front. Well, corny and pizza sound like a good combination, so you're on the right track there. But uh, the last thing I'll, I'll leave you with for for this segment, just mm -hmm. is there – maybe it's the Ramon Walker a story that you already shared, but is there is there another funny story that stands out to you just being able to shoot all the different commercials? Uh, the Ramon Walker one was very special because we shot some of that in the restaurant with a full uh, – restaurant full of people. There oh, was wow. – a couple of reporters had come out uh, – uh, because we knew we were going to be doing that that day. It was scheduled a couple days ahead. So we knew for sure it was going to be, you know, three o'clock Sunday afternoon. Um, I was, I had my team around me. I was a little more comfortable that when I had learned, I need a shot list, um, all the things that I wanted to do. And I actually shot two different things all at once with him. Um, and just sort of mixed it up to try and take as little of his time as we could. And of course, you know, we're doing this while the kitchen is open and we're back there playing around in the kitchen and my guys are looking at me, hey, get out of the way. We're trying to make pizza here, <laughs> you know, and, but everybody was very respectful. And, and when we sat down to do our awkward little paperwork thing and take a couple of pictures, everybody at that point knew who he was. Um, and there were some Cougar fans in there. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> everybody stood up and gave him when we shook hands, everybody stood up and gave him a standing ovation and said, you know, congratulations, young man. And people were coming over and taking pictures. And and that made it feel really special because yeah. uh, we didn't get to do that with Tremont and Marcus. We, we really tried to respect their privacy and their time. And uh, Ramon just happened to be three o'clock on Sunday. There was nothing. There was no way around it. Um, the other guys were you know, 530 on Monday night. And uh, when things change, things change. So it, it all worked out great. So that was that was a really neat moment in getting to put all that stuff together. That's awesome. That's going to do it for the second of three series focusing on name, image, and likeness sponsored by at or presented by at Texas Juan on Twitter. Uh, this is a short three segment series focusing on Hoop and Holler and Star Pizza and kind of their rise to the NIL and what it, it has been like to work with UH athletes. Once again, thank you to Mike Pittman for taking the time out of his day to speak with me. And that's going to do it. Be sure to be on the lookout for the third and final episode focusing on Star Pizza and Hoop and Holler, which will debut next week as a part of the Pod Slime and Jamma podcast. Once again, thank you for tuning in. And welcome back to Pod Slime and Jamma. Once again, you just finished hearing the second segment, the second of three segments. If you missed the first segment, kind of on the origins of on the Hoop and Holler Semi Collective, you can go back and check that on the archives. That was our uh 
September, our most recent show last week. And obviously, of course, if you're watching on the YouTube channel, be sure to check it out on this clip of its own. Uh, we'll have a third and final segment on Hoop and Holler next week that'll focus much more of name, image, and likeness across the entire University of Houston. Obviously, the most recent headliner, H-O-U-N-I-L with Go Cougs, has been uh, a more trendy when it comes to recent and actually the anthony jones uh posted his own article on what had happened on kansas that's something that's worth checking out you're a houston fan where he kind of gave his perspective on what happened against kansas he gave a lot of good details he said uh, it, again kind of what has been a common theme when it comes to a lot of players a lot of the small things that they need to correct a lot of frustration building uh just across with how the season has gone early on for houston but speaking of the defense we're going to focus much more on the defensive side of things heading into rice uh, doug belk when it came to what specifically were the struggles against kansas he was asked about that and he talked a little bit about a lot of it just gave credit to Kansas because of what they did specifically when it came with the personnel and a lot of the schemes that they were able to run that gave Houston a lot of problems. Here's what Doug Bell had to say. Uh, I don't. I think it's a combination of a lot of different things. Um, obviously, you got to give credit to their coaching staff and their players and the and the way that they executed at a high level. It was almost flawless. Uh, didn't make a lot of mistakes, uh, and we made more mistakes than they did. And when you play a ball control possession option offense, uh, you got to. You can't allow those guys to extend drives. And we weren't able to get off the field a lot on critical situations, third and 10, going in, quarterback counter for a touchdown. Uh, we had them backed up <clears throat> when it was 21-14. Uh, we sent a pressure. We missed the quarterback. He scrambles for a first down. Um, and then the list goes on, you know, of things that you have to make those plays in those critical, critical times. And, you know, we have to be in the right call as well uh, to stop those guys. And I think they re- did a really good job. You know, we didn't lack physical toughness. And we didn't lack effort, um, you know, just the eye discipline and the things that it takes to be consistent versus that type of offense. Uh, we saw 10 different personnel groupings, shifts, motions, and then you add the option in with that. Uh, very difficult to defend, and we didn't do a good enough job defending it, obviously. Uh, but we, I mean, you really just got to give those guys a lot of credit for what they were able to do. And we have to fix the issues that we had and things that we did not do well. So once again, that was Houston defensive coordinator Doug Belk gave a lot of credit to Kansas. But again, uh, something that Belk and a lot of the defensive players reiterated, they're not really wanted when they were asked about the Rice matchup, they didn't necessarily want to focus on what the Owls bring to the table. Now, obviously, of course, they, they have new quarterback that, that Houston didn't see a season ago. They have a, a top receiver that, again, Houston didn't wasn't able to see in that matchup. But a lot of the emphasis was kind of in-house and the defense kind of reiterated that really it's a lot of the mistakes that Houston is doing and they're trying to correct those before they have to worry about what the opposing teams are doing. Yeah. And I think that has to do with just missing assignments, like being getting yeah. lined up right, making sure everyone's on one accord on what the play call is and what the situation is and why they're executing certain different plays in certain different situations. So I think that's, that's why we're hearing a lot of do your job. And I think it's rightfully so because I think the talents, they're the defensive line, they're getting there, they're getting pressure. But at times, you know, if you have a rushing quarterback, you can't always rush outside. You got to rush to contain to try to keep him in the pocket and not allow him to get outside versus rushing and try to get a sack. And so yeah, it's different things. So I'm sure all three levels, like Coach Doug Belt mentioned, that they can just do better. And like I said, I think Rice is a, a, a team that they'll be able to do that against. I know Rice has a different quarterback who's coming from the, um, a bigger program where he's seen better football. He probably has a little bit of talent to sling it around. But I think overall in the trenches, Houston to be able to control a line of scrimmage on both sides. Yeah, and those little things, that's something that Art Green, who's one of the other players that spoke, um, he kind of reiterated what you just said, Dayon, and that's going back to the little things when it came, when it comes to uh, making reads. He said it, it has been a couple of times during the season where, you know, if a player just filled in a certain gap or they made the uh, a quicker read or they made the, the correct read, they would, instead of giving up a first down, they could get opposing teams to second and eight, second and ten. And obviously, of course, they went back to penalty. So, again, like you mentioned, going back to doing your job that's that's been the main focus and one of the interesting things that that Art Green said is he feels that if 
Houston can correct all those mistakes. It, it, the other key part is the confidence aspect of it, where they feel if they can get all that corrected, they can not only compete with anyone, but they can beat with any, they can beat anyone. Is what our Green said. So that that's again, like you mentioned, going back to doing your job. That's the main focus for Houston heading into Rice and kind of taking a step back and taking a look in the mirror. Yep, taking a look in the mirror and actually see how you want the rest of your season to go. You face some adversity. And like um, you mentioned earlier, how Coach Belk and everyone was kind of trying to throw last year a go and find your identity. This is the time to find this year, this team's identity. Last year, teams able to um, fight adversity well and bounce back and get on the road. Now this is their chance to do the same thing. But how will they bounce back? Will they come back? Will they dominate? Will they do better on their assignments and then play? play an even tougher game the next week and be able to sustain um, the mm-hmm. level that they're accustomed to, the standard that they're used to playing at um, from a season ago, or or will they be like the Houston of old, um, that I should say. And so um, mm-hmm. I, I guess we got to wait and see, but I, I'm confident that Houston will be able to bounce back against Rice. And one of those other leaders on the defensive side of the ball, Trevarius Owens, he was asked about kind of, kind of just what the mood of the defense is heading into Rice. Here's what he had to say about uh, kind of the emotional aspect of the defense. Is not really going to say upset, but it's just like, you know, like when you when you can sense that you're constantly missing, missing opportunities to be what you know you can be. So, like, it's just – it's kind of like – a disappointment that we got to get we got to get it turned turned around because we know we know we're a great defense and we know we're capable of doing it and we we haven't put that on film either these past three weeks so it's uh I feel like you guys are going to see a very motiv- motivated group here here moving forward and knowing that we have a standard to uphold and we haven't been upholding that standard that standard and we've been letting the city down and uh we're working overtime to get to get all this stuff fixed right now so we can go and put a, a complete product on, on film we have a standard to uphold and we haven't been able to put, we haven't been able to hold up that standard. Those strong words from Owens there. Uh, anything else catch your eye on that? Yeah, that caught my eye and just uh, represented the city of Houston, how much pride Houston players have for when they play for the U of H. Because when you do well, um, the city lit. I mean, you can get out, people see you, and you can have your fun. But um, also, with Javier, he's been playing really well. He's been yeah. playing really well, um, coming up and tackling, making plays in, in the backfield, getting PBUs, interceptions. He's been playing really well. But um, as a unit, they got to put it all together consistently for four quarters, and so, so does the offense. I think another thing that Coach Bill talked about, um, we might not play the clip, is when he talked about when losses, um, everything is magnified. But yeah. when you win, some things may be kind of overlooked. It's, I'm just kind of paraphrasing, but that's kind of um, what he said. And so I think that was a, a real true statement. And But just still got to clean those things up and not be complacent when you win. Because when you play a Rice team, you might win, but you still may be able to give give up a couple of plays and still withstand, um, withstand that and win the game. But that's not um, – good for where they're trying to go as far as just like Javier on just mentioned, uh, uh, um, getting back to that standard and, and playing to that standard with Holden. And so um, they should be able to do that against Rice. And that's a great point. That that goes back to the discipline aspect of it because Belk did kind of allude to that. And you, like you mentioned, when it comes to losses, a lot of stuff get magnified. And particularly when, when you think of a defense, whenever they're – obviously they're going to be going 100 miles per hour. And if they – whether make a wrong read or maybe they take a gamble on a on – a, to get a make a turnover interception or anything like that. If they don't get it in a tough loss, that gets magnified. So that's something that Belk, like you mentioned, reiterated uh, during his availability. And one of the other parts, specifically on the defensive backs, uh, like you mentioned, Javarius Owens, he's been uh, one of the, the strong, solid, consistent players early on in the season. And when you look at that secondary, much more broadly, uh, Doug Belk said that the stability of the group has been Alex Hogan, Art Green, obviously, of course, of course, Gio has been a part of it. He had really high praise uh, for Hassan Hippolyte, and Jace Rogers was one of the last players he mentioned when it came to the stability of the defensive backs. And then kind of looking at the rest of it, it one of the things that Dana Orr said, said he wishes they were be able to develop more quickly is the depth overall. Uh, Doug Buck, when he was asked about the depth, obviously, of course, a lot of the players, when you think outside of those five, 
And coming into the season, it, it kind of looked like they were going to be the starters. And obviously what they had been able to show in flashes last season, um, they were expected to do good, but more more so when it comes to the people uh, behind them, that's kind of been the issue when it comes to, obviously, of course, they're still younger. And one of the keys to being able to develop that depth is to be able to give them and not only to be able to learn through their mistakes, but be able to get more playing time. And that's something that specifically against Kansas, like Buck said, that they didn't really have a lot of opportunity to be able to do just because of what Kansas was able to do and all the different alignments and all the different packages that they were running uh, against a team like Rice. That could be something that honestly could be much more crucial for a lot of the other defensive backs that aren't necessarily the starters that need a lot more of that experience. And one of the other things going back to when it, when it comes to um, – a lot of confidence. That's something that they need to kind of build back up when it comes to the defensive side of the ball. Um, it's one of our final clips is just what Doug Belk had to say on just the overall mindset of the of the defensive side of things heading into Rice. Uh, came off the field. We had a good practice. Um, you know, we've talked about things that we need to work on to improve to get to where we want to go. And, uh, you know, just reemphasize the things that, <clears throat> that we need to do to win. And overall, when you play the type caliber teams that we've played, uh, you can't make the type of mistakes that we've made in certain situations. And we got, we got to be better consistently. And so we've been focusing on those things and what we need to do uh, more, though, more so than just our opponent. So I think it's a combination of a lot of different things that we have to improve on. Uh, they, they're up for the challenge. And, you know, for them, the, the message is, I mean, the season's not over. I mean, we're three games in. we got nine more guaranteed opportunities. And we haven't started conference play yet. Uh, we got a rivalry game for a trophy this weekend. And so our guys are excited about that. And uh, really just getting back to work. So things are going well. Um, not as well as we would like them, obviously, but this is the position that we're in, and we got to make the best of where we're at if we want to get to where we want to go. This is the position that we are in. We got to make the best of it. Uh, real quickly, before we kind of get into specifics of what Belk said, a couple of interesting uh, just tidbits when it comes to Houston Rice overall. Houston has actually won the last previous six matchups against the Rice. I was going back to 2011. So that's actually, if Houston can win on Saturday, it would be the longest uh, winning streak that either of the two programs have had. And obviously, of course, the two teams met last season, 2021 at Rice. Houston won. 45 to 7. So a big lopsided victory for Houston in that sense. Dan, when it comes to the defense overall, whether what you heard Doug Belk say in that clip again, just three games in, it's kind of interesting when it comes from a fan perspective. Two back to back, two tough back to back losses that they were probably magnified by the fact that they were Big 12 opponents. And when you think of the Big 12 and the football programs, you don't, the first two teams that come up in your head are not Texas Tech and Kansas. So that's the big reason why a lot of fans, um, it, yeah, those losses hurt a lot more with just where Houston is going in less than a year now. But uh, obviously, Doug Buck right there, it's kind of taking a step back. The sky's not falling. They still have a lot of season left to play. They still have a lot of season. For, yep, they do. And they still have a chance to make it to the American Conference game. And they, they really do, and they really did get a taste of what Big 12 football is like, whether although it be Texas Tech and Kansas. I mean, I, I, I do, in my opinion, believe it's a different level between playing the two lanes and the Tulsa, no disrespects of the world. And although I, I say that and say that, you know, I don't even say that, but I, uh, I, I do think that, but I think Houston has a chance to to go on a roll and starting with Rice, go one and zero. Just don't look ahead, take care of business with Rice. And then the following week, you do the same thing, and then eventually you look up, you in the American, you in the conference championship game, and you could potentially win that, go to another bowl game, and go off the hype again. I mean, I mean, that's how you can do it. Stack them up one one by one. No, you got to take care of business, right? Expect them to dominate, especially the defense. And like um, Coach Doug Belk said, this is, this is a good game for them, for them, for sure. Yeah, again, kind of highlighting other notes. I'm heading into the Rice matchup. Something that Dana Hoverson broke on Monday is that Malik Robinson, the linebacker, is going to be out for the season with a pectoral muscle. Um, so that's that's obviously a big blow to the Houston defense. Donovan Mutin, who Doug Belk has called the quarterback of the defense, he's dealing with a couple of bang. The way Doug Belk phrased it, he's dealing with a couple of you know, nicks and knacks, but he's expected to be good uh, for Rice on Saturday. And Jamal Morris, who 
another linebacker is one of the players that Doug Buck, another player that he was really high on. And just in com- when it comes to the intangibles that he brings to the table, um, that Houston might he might end up getting a lot more um a lot more load getting put on his shoulders just in terms of what what kind of the linebacker position has kind of shaken up after uh, the kansas game both with injuries and just in terms of uh more responsibilities on morris's shoulders yeah one player we've been seeing a lot of was nunnery um we know he mm-hmm. was battling with um uh Rock malik for their starting linebacker, now he's went out. He played a lot against Kansas. So, and last season, the coach Bill raved about his athleticism and his ability this to make plays was just uncomparable. So, I'm able to see him continue to develop because he's only a sophomore. I know he mentioned um, the other one, but that's who I, who I want to see feel that linebacker spot continue to grow because he's a rangy, very athletic kid. He played safety in high school at um, at Shadow Creek, and so. I think he, he can develop well, but overall the defense has to play better. They got to get turnovers. They got to play a full four quarters. Um, I know I don't expect them to maybe shut out Rice. I wouldn't be surprised if they did, but still you put it together a full four quarters without uh, with giving up touchdowns or points. I should say. Shadow Creek shout out out in West Paralyzed. Now the one the one other thing I did want to add, and this was. Uh, Going back to what Art Green mentioned and kind of um, the depth when it comes to defensive backs, uh, one of the things that he kind of compared to where he was uh, the last couple of seasons where he was playing behind Marion Williams, behind Marcus Jones, and the way Art Green would approach it, he said it was a lot more of he was just trying to learn as much as he could from those two players, how they approach the game, how they practice, how they they acted during the game, what was their approach, and he was really much more of a sponge, and now that he is in a position to be uh, the starter for Houston, and again, another player that both Belk and Horwitz have been high on early on in the season, um, he said that gave him a lot of the confidence that he, he knows what he's supposed to do in that role, and that's something that's kind of, they're trying to push forward to a lot of the younger guys, where obviously, of course, when it comes to correcting mistakes and stuff like that in practice that's that's uh, that's expected but just giving them that confidence that's kind of the key for a defensive unit we know what they were able to do last year and again going back to that identity um thing theme overall it's something that just they're trying to figure out who exactly they are um and like we mentioned throughout the show rice it's expected that it'd be a good game to uh, in, and let's read coups i call it a get well game and you hate to say that against rice but again um that's Especially when it comes exactly, especially when it comes to spread, this is a team that Houston is, is expected to dominate and should be able to, especially with something that they haven't done early on in the season, be able to clean it up and play a full four quarters. Something that defensively, offensively, and even the special teams they haven't been able to do early on in the season. They haven't, and, and so I can't wait to see if they can and what it will look like. But they have to sustain it, and you can't. Uh, I don't want to see a, a, a good first half, good second half, where I expect a consistent uh, through the air and on the ground. I want to see some balance on offense. Defensively, really just about cleaning up mistakes, limiting big plays, missed assignments, like they said. I think the defense have played well enough to win games. I think just um, situational football, like I mentioned earlier, need to do a better job of doing that and take care of their assignments in situation football and offense needs to sustain drives and and give the defense some rest from playing so many plays. Um, that's another factor that we talk, um, need to mention. And so um, I think they should be able to do that. I mean, it's another home game. But, um, I don't know how the crowd will be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's a, it's a whole nother story, but they'll be at home. So there'll be some comfort in that. And um, the they should win. Yeah, yeah last the, the last game against Kansas, it drew an attendance of over 30,000 against Rice. It's going to be this upcoming Saturday, September 24th, like you said, Dayan, once again at TDCU Stadium. It will be a 5 p.m. Central Time kickoff, and the game will be an ESPN Plus exclusive. And if if you can watch it on ESPN Plus and want to listen to it, that will be on KPRC 950 a.m. But that's going to do it for today's episode. So once again, if you haven't done so already, like you see it scrolling in the ticker, like we mentioned at the 
top of the show, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and Pod Slam Jam. It helps us out a lot, a lot. And our big goal is to get a thousand subscribers. And obviously, of course, we're we're getting into the middle of the football season. To, well, we're a quarter through the football season, so uh, over twenty five percent. Once they take on Rice, it'll be much closer to the middle. And obviously, of course, conference play that's a big uh, benchmark for the football team once that starts. And we're getting close to October, and you know what that means as well. Uh, basketball oh, season basketball. just around the corner. Um, I believe both the men's and women's they might be. I think they might be starting off their initial practices um, next week. So that's going to be something to keep an eye on. So a lot of exciting things happening with UH Athletics. Oh, yeah, and that's this big thing when it comes to the Houston Cougars joining the Big 12 in less than a year now. So please help us out, subscribe to the podcast, share it with other UH fans that may not have heard of us. So anything helps us out. We appreciate all the listeners, all the supporters, and obviously, of course, when it comes to Let's Rage Cougs, if you have participated, even commented, it has really helped us out. We we like to see that growth. It, it helps and it motivates us to, to keep going. Um, and, Dan, I'll, I'll let you have the final word as always, sir. Well, I appreciate all our fans who, who watch Let's Rage Cougs. Um, we need all of you who watch just take – couple seconds and when you watch next week we expect you all to return to make sure you like and subscribe um thank you all who have subscribed to our podcast we make sure you look well to youtube but i'm expecting cooks man to turn it around um i i hope they do i expect them to and appreciate you all for watching this go cooks